afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about some of the components that you can find in more detail um, in the report. I'm going to try to be quick here. We have a lot to cover, and uh, Tucker, in a moment, will cover one of the impact categories of pathogens, so I want to leave them some time. Um, the first thing usually we like to talk about when we've been talking about this um, is that manure irrigation is just a component of a manure system, right? And it's the land application component. And, and one of the things that we try to remind everybody that we've talked to this about is manure irrigation is a selection of practice, um, and it's going to be compared to other manure application practices. So a lot of times we try to keep that in mind in our discussion, and that this wasn't manure irrigation or nothing. Right? Typically, all of these fields um, that we're talking about in Wisconsin that have irrigation equipment, if they didn't get irrigated with manure, they'd get traditional or other types of manure application um, applied to them. So uh, we tried to really frame this as you're trying to compare this to other technologies and see what the benefits or drawbacks are. Um, the other thing that is important to notice to note is that it's part of the system, and one of the things is manure irrigation. You can't really accomplish manure irrigation without doing at least some minor processing. Uh, typically, it requires some solid removal. Um, you can accomplish that with some um, uh, complex systems, uh, processing systems, mechanical systems, or we've seen a few people achieve it through multi-stage um, storages. So there's a few options on how you do that, but the majority of uh, manure irrigation systems can't handle solids um, at the content level that are that is um, traditionally found um, as excreted or even as it's diluted in manure storage systems. Um, there are lots of things that a system can control that you can control in a system. Um, oops, I lost. Oh, there we go. Um, so one of the things we told people is we're trying to get them to understand there's a lot of pieces and a lot of management to each system. As we discussed a lot of this stuff, so I want you to become a little familiar with some of these things, that not all systems are the same and that there's a lot of pieces that may impact the, the types of things we're talking about, like odor or runoff or other things. So one of the things we try to remind people, you can control the rate of application. You can change the pressure and the nozzle type. Right, the nozzle types used for manure are much larger. Um, on the traveling gun, that can handle maybe four, maybe up to 5% total solids. Um, on the manure irrigation, the center pivot system, the types of nozzles, sometimes they're called trash nozzles or other things that are used for manure, are very different than what you'd use for water irrigation. Right, And they produce droplets that are much different than what you would see in traditional application systems that apply water or maybe apply some kind of chemical, right? So it, the, the conditions that might apply for those systems might be very different um, than the ones that apply here. Also, there's an end gun on the system, so we talk a lot about that you can turn that on or off, um, and that there are really computerized systems that are out there um, that can help you detect wind speed, automatic shutoff, turning off certain components for um, working over waterways, et cetera. So here's just a few images. This is what we have drop down nozzles, right? These were a really big um, discussion point, and that the lower you could get your drop nozzles closer to the crop um, would be beneficial. Again, in a lot of these center pivots, you can get nozzles, drop nozzles that go all the way to the ground. Um, in this case, you can see these are higher up because they grew corn in this field. And later in the season, they didn't want to have to change out the position. But it's really important that you understand that all of the systems are not the same and that the impact from where you have drop nozzles, your release height um, is quite important. So here's an up close picture of one of the nozzles playing manure. Again, this is a specialized nozzle. And the pressures that we run center pivot systems with manure on are much lower than we typically run them with water or other things. So in general, the nozzles and the pressures are designed to have larger droplet sizes, and in a moment, um, I'll talk about some impact categories and why that's important. Um, next, Ooh, I think my computer seems to not want to move forward here. Oh, there we go. Um, is that you can have some control systems, right? There are really advanced control systems. So that's so that you can shut off even like a pie slice, or you can shut off very small zones um, in these varial rate irrigation applications. So 
we had a lot of discussions about, oh, well, I want, I, how am I supposed to, uh, uh, I need to operate through a waterway. And we were saying, no, there are technologies to avoid things like operating through a waterway and shutting off and trying to protect certain resources when you're using this kind of. All right, when we were talking about the practice, there are a lot of things we, we centered our discussion around, um, which include uh, when we apply man, uh, manure with an irrigation system, how does that change our uh, droplet movement? How does that disperse? Um, when it disperses, when we're talking about pathogens, we have some microbial inactivation from the sunlight. How does temperature, how does humidity affect that microbial inactivation? Um, how a lot of times we got to talking about setback distances. How far should I be from a house or a well or surface water? Um, is this practice have advantages or is it disadvantageous to use in comparison to other practices in terms of groundwater penetration? We do have some areas with like karst fracture bedrock in Wisconsin, and so it was a big discussion of whether um, whether we would see benefits or drawbacks from this system compared to traditional. Okay, so what we did is we kind of, um, in the report, there's a lot more detail about each of these if you want more, but we kind of broke down um, the impact factors into five areas. One was drift, odor, water quality, air quality, and pathogens. So um, in the drift area, we heard a lot of people talking about drift, some talking about spraying onto their house or spraying onto the sidewalk. And really this drift to us means the aerial movement of liquid outside the intended application area. And that's different from overspray, right? We called overspray when you hit a house or a sidewalk, we define that as overspray. And we always agreed that that was not a practice that we would ever support and that that should always be avoided. And you should be able to control that um, with understanding your irrigation system and using information like um, wind uh, information and other things. Um, so drift is that movement typically caused by wind. So you're going to get a little movement off of the intended area. And you need to be a little more careful when you're applying near a school, right? So application, uh, uh, app location becomes really important in a lot of these things. Um, we talked about how there were not a lot of regulations for other uh, manure application methods, that drift was not um, important in there, but that we realized we really needed to think about it more, especially if we had higher um, release um, height for, um, irriga uh, for manure irrigation, particularly with center pivots and um, the traveling gun. So what the things we determined, if you wanted to use manure irrigation, it was important to maximize your droplet size, and ASAE has a standard, so we're talking about medium to coarse. And again, the type of systems we're using here, generally produce larger droplet sizes, so you would want to select equipment that uh, and pressures that achieve that uh, droplet size that's in the medium to coarse or higher range. Um, you want to minimize your release height, um, and then you have to, you know, we really recommended that you needed to keep an eye on wind speeds, automatic shutoff, things that when the wind gets too high, you can see in that top picture, that was on a really windy day, compared to the bottom picture on a not very windy, Day, you can see the difference in the drift that you see. So the conditions are really important. And then also using barriers and other things are really important in order to minimize that. Um, one of the thing, one of the biggest concerns we got about manure irrigation was odor. Um, and there really is, odor is going to be a bigger concern with manure irrigation than almost any other manure application method. Um, so the perception is variable. There are, it's a, it's a greatest citizen concern um, was for some of the odors produced. They had a lot of concern for um, the, like being outside, having repeated application, uh, that the odor was really impacting their life. Um, so generally always greater. There are ways to mitigate though. In this case, higher winds um, greater than five miles an hour increases um, dispersion. So again, now you're trying to balance the odor versus the drift and kind of operating, we recommend it in this five to 10 mile an hour range. Um, you want edge of field bar barriers. You want to think about where are people? You know, there are some cases in our state where there were folks who had an irrigation system that was nowhere near anybody else. They owned all the surrounding fields. And so drift and odor were not really that big of a deal. There's others who are trying to operate irrigation systems 
where their boundaries were with um, that had houses near them. And if you're looking to put an irrigation system in and you don't already have it in, those selection of those fields is really a mistake. And also we talked about how manure processing could really reduce some of the odors, like using um, a digester, a number of the facilities that um, had irrigation had digesters. Again, you can mitigate some of these odors, but comparatively to other practices, manure irrigation odors will be greater. Um, water quality, we talked a little bit about this. Really, we started to think about that so long as you would avoid application rates that re resulted in runoff, that we may actually, with multiple applications, be able to decrease some of the impacts of leaching and that we would have less penetration into the, into the soil surface um, and, and downward with multiple applications instead of one application in the fall or spring as we do with traditional applications. So we saw this as a benefit in some ways, but there really isn't any direct information on manure. We were taking information and applying it from other uh, research. Um, and again, we really targeted that you can't use an irrigation system through a waterway, right? You have to use those more controlled systems um, to avoid that kind of situation. Um, air quality, we talked about particulate matter, greenhouse gas emissions, hazardous air pollutants. Um, we used OSHA occupational standards and Wisconsin ambient air standards to kind of look at um, where we were falling um, when we used uh, manure irrigation. Now, there's not a lot of data for manure irrigation systems, particulate, particulate matter, um, not very much on greenhouse gas emissions for that particular land application. But we just talked about the mechanisms that may increase or decrease in the report these particular components. Obviously, in a lot of cases, this type of application system would increase some of these. Um, and hazardous air pollutants, particularly hydrogen sulfide, people had some concerns about. We did have the state uh, folks at the public health had measured a number of times around these systems and never um, had really had a hydrogen sulfide reading um, that, uh, that they could document as being close to anything near the OSHA occupational. Um, Again, there are similar mitigation te techniques to the other um, odor uh, as using edge of field barriers, keeping larger droplets and having a low release these heights. Um, there's one more impact category, which is path pathogens, and Tucker's gonna talk about that in a moment, so I'm gonna leave that to him to cover. Um, but I do wanna talk about just um, two additional things before I let him take over. One is that we really talked a lot about application timing. Right, and that we, we are really, we heard from producers a lot that they're really running into these scenarios where they cannot, um, they don't have enough time in the spring and fall to apply their manure, right? It, particularly those who are not allowed to um, apply during a frozen ground. And so we put kind of this imaging up just to give an idea for people when you have rainstorms um, or you have precipitation or, or melting events, you're really limiting. And, and you're not allowed to uh, apply in the winter, you really have tight windows some years of when you can get manure out in the field. And so what we found with irrigation is that that really expands your windows and can reduce, um, not, not only can you do multiple applications, which can be more tailored to the, uh, the timing of the plant, um, so you might get better nutrient use efficiency, um, that you also, um, can avoid some of the issues that happen, you know, when people apply during times they shouldn't be applying because they're facing a tight window um, or other similar things to that, you know, issues with tons of road traffic at the same time. So we did think that there are some significant benefits to be noted um, with application time. And then we had a few scenarios, and if you look at the report, you can see some other information. We are really trying to lay out what does it mean if you switch from a more conventional application system using maybe tankers on the road to trying a, a field with a manure irrigation, right? So we said, well, you know, there's a lot of scenarios to think about here, but for a certain size farm, we kind of map this out and say they had a, a bunch of fields and this farm had 250 tanker loads a year, right? And maybe they did one or two applications per year on each field. Now that if they switch to having some manure irrigation, Maybe their tanker loads reduced by almost half. So you'd see, if you lived near there, you might see less traffic. 
But then if you live close to the field with manure irrigation, you may have more instances of application. And I think one of the important things we talked about was setting some rules on how many times, you know, we, we really had some discussions about 20 t applications if I live next door to a field is way too many, four is reasonable, right? So we, just, we discussed a lot about um, what that application number should be, if there's a maximum or not, and also um, a little bit about setbacks, which kind of get to some of the consensus issues we came to.